beautiful day. And we're so excited to live the name of Jesus. Our God is unstoppable. Amen. His glory reigns forever. All impossible things in His name, it shall be done. So let's lift our praise to Him. Come on. We are here to declare, to lift our prayers up. If we sing it, it intensifies. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for our worship encounter. Here we are to worship you. Here we are, God, to bow down 
and thank you for the opportunity to lift our voice and lift our hands to you alone. You love with no reservation. You're not looking for perfection. There's no need in me pretending. I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. You deserve my full attention. Nothing less than my devotion. Oh, speak to me and I will listen. I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. Oh, oh, oh. you can have my heart. You can have my heart. my heart be the lord of my emotions set me free from selfish motives and search me till there's nothing hidden i'll give you everything i'll give you everything
God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story. going to miss out Lord Jesus we will lift our voice we will bow because here we are to worship you here we are to worship Say that you're my God. 
gateway for worshiping with us please have a moment to move around take a few steps bless your neighbors look somebody who are new in this house bless them with your beautiful smile thank you gateway amen Good morning, Gateway. Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. As usual, it's a wonderful day to be here in God's house. And we are so glad that each and every one of you are here with us today. But if you're a guest with us, we want to extend an extra special welcome to you. We feel so honored and privileged that you chose to come and spend your Sunday with us here at Gateway. So thank you for joining us today. If you are one of those guests and you don't have a church of your very own, we'd love to have you come back and join us again here at Gateway. And for all of our first time guests, we do have a special guest gift bag for you. At the end of today's service, you'll find a friendly volunteer at a table in the southwest corner of the auditorium. So at the end of the service, you can make your way there and let them know it's your very first time at Gateway today. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar at gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening for everything going on here at the church throughout the week. Also, you can find us on social media at Gateway Church Regina on Facebook and YouTube and at gateway.regina on Instagram. Speaking of calendar, here are a few dates to remember. Next Sunday, May 12th is Mother's Day, so we wanna encourage you to be inviting your mom to join you for church. What a great way to spend Mother's Day. Whether it be your biological mom, a stepmom, spiritual mom, or a woman that has been a great influence in your life, invite them to come and join you right here for church next Sunday. Starting on Tuesday, May 21st at 7 p.m. is our next series of Getting a Grip on the Basics Discipleship class. This is a great class on the basics of Christianity and our walk with the Lord, facilitated by Wally Adabogan. But this is not just a class for new Christians, this is a class for everyone. It goes through the basics of Christianity and walks us through on being a real disciple of Jesus. So make sure you're getting in on Getting a Grip on the Basics starting Tuesday, May 21st at 7 p.m. right here at Gateway. On the weekend of May 24th to 26th, we are so excited to have our good friends of Gateway Tu and Quang fam here with us for that weekend. The weekend will be starting on May 24th, which is a Friday night at 7 p.m. with our Ladies' Night with Tu. This is gonna be a great evening for all ladies aged 10 and up to come and hear the story of Tu's life, sharing some dessert and fellowship together. So once again, ladies, this is for you on Friday, May 24th at 7 p.m. right here at Gateway. This is also a great Great opportunity ladies to invite a friend to come and join you for a casual night here at the church also we would love to have an idea of how many ladies to prepare for on this evening so if you're planning to come please register today at the info desk following the service 
Then on Sunday, May 26, we are excited to have Tu and Kwong with us for both of our Sunday morning services. Kwong will be bringing a good word about the love of Jesus to us right here at Gateway. Many of you know Kwong and his brother, Pastor Trung, who is our missions partner in Vietnam, were both saved from drug addiction in Vietnam. After they were saved and free from drugs, they started the network of rehab centers that we support today in Vietnam. So Kwong has an amazing story of the life-changing power of Jesus, and he is going to bring a great message on Sunday, May 26th. So make sure you're here and inviting someone to join you for May 26th, 930 and 1130 services. You've heard us talking about Come Together. Come Together is a multi-church unity event happening at Mosaic Stadium on June 7th and 8th. Now this is an event for Christians and this is an event that is going to be used as a tool for Christians to invite unsaved. We want to see Mosaic Stadium packed to share Jesus' love with as many people as possible. Now this is a concert event. There's some great artists that are coming, namely two country artists. High Valley has recently signed on as as well as George Canyon. Also, there will be worship artists such as Upper Room coming. So this is a two-night event, Friday and Saturday night. You can get tickets for the event on cometogether.day. So make sure you're registering right away to get your tickets as there is a cap on the amount of tickets available for the event. But we want to see many people coming to this event and mostly many people coming to know the life-changing power of Jesus. So make sure you're inviting your unsaved friends. We have some special new invitations cards for this event available at the info desk. On these invitation cards, it highlights the two country artists, High Valley and George Canyon, that will be performing at this event. And you may not know these are country artists, but they are both Christians. They love Jesus and they are excited to be able to come to this event and share Jesus' love with the people that will be there. So make sure you're grabbing some of those cards at the info desk today and invite people to join you for Come Together happening June 7th and 8th right here in Regina. Many of you know of Gateway Cambodia. That is the mission we support in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, run by Taka and Christina Miano and their family. They currently have about 27 youth and children in their care. So today, following the service, on your way out of the auditorium, you will be handed a newsletter with an update about what has been going on at Gateway Cambodia. So make sure you take that, read about it, and hear what God is doing with our missions partners in Cambodia. Thank you, Gateway parents, for picking up your children as soon as today's service is done. We know it's tempting to stand around and visit with your friends, but we'd love if you could do us a favor. As soon as the service is done, head on upstairs, retrieve your children, and then come down and continue your visiting with everyone. This makes it so much easier for our Gateway Kids volunteers, who we love so much, who give up their time weekly to help make Gateway Kids possible. Thank you, Gateway, for your faithful giving into God's house, your obedience to God's word, and bringing your tithe into the local church. It's because of your giving we can keep church moving forward right here at Gateway Regina and keep pointing people to Jesus and celebrating changed lives. There are four ways you can give today. The first way is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. The second way to give is by e-transfer. You can simply transfer to gateway.donations at gmail.com. Com. We recommend this way as there are no fees involved whatsoever with e-transfer. The third way to give is by giving online. You can go to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts to give with card or PayPal. And the fourth way to give is text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now. That's all I got for you today, Gateway. So have a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday. Remember to invite someone to join you for church next week, specifically maybe your mom. Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for the next part in our series, Why So Sad? All right, good afternoon, Gateway. As usual, great to have you in the house. And you know what, today I want to introduce to you a special guest that we have with us, and that would be Pastor Jordan Gadsby. He is the regional director of ACOP, which is the organization of churches that we are a part of. And uh, so he is in town for, for the, uh, the 100th anniversary celebration of the Regina Apostolic Church this weekend. And, and uh, so while he's in town, he wanted to pop in and pay us a visit. And, and as I told the, the, the 930 crew, I said, I'm so grateful that Jordan gave me the heads up that he's going to be coming so I, I would know to be on my best behavior. You know what I mean? Right. You're always right? on your best behavior, aren't you? 
Uh, well, <laughs> by the grace of God. But, uh, but I told the, uh, the earlier service that and I'm just so thankful that he didn't just wear a disguise and come like a secret shopper, you know, incognito. So Pastor Brian doesn't even know he's sitting there at the back. But uh, welcome. Yeah, well, come on. Let's give Jordan a, a real warm <laughs> gateway welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, if I had come as a secret shopper, I would see people loving Jesus and following him together. Absolutely, and yes. I love it here. It was, it was a privilege <laughs> to worship with you guys. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for that. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, I, I love coming to visit. This is the first time I've been here on a Sunday morning, mm -hmm. uh, but I've been here during the week many times, and I come and stop in with, with Pastor Brian and Barb and Rebecca. Uh, you guys are amazing. Uh, one of the things, when, when I come and, and visit, uh, my wife Chantal said, well, how was it? How was it visiting Brian? I said, well, I always come to, to pastors and churches hoping I can be an encouragement and offer a word of encourage, encouragement to people. And I leave from a coffee meeting with Pastor Brian just feeling more encouraged than I came. So thank you for that. I'm sure you've experienced that as well. It works both ways. <laughs> church, if I can just give you a blessing. Uh, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi and he said, uh, May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ fill you with grace uh, and peace. And that's not something that just is passive in our life. That, that's the power of God invading our reality and creating the kingdom mm -hmm. of God in us. And, and as he does that, may you be filled with the power and boldness of the Holy Spirit as you love him. And yes. Him. Amen. Thank you, Amen. <laughs> really nice to have you here this morning, Jordan. And uh, when you think about uh, Jordan in your, you know, in your times of prayer, you do have times of prayer throughout the week, correct? And and so when you're, when you're wondering, who should I intercede for? This would be a real good man right here to, to be praying for because, you know, he's zigzagging around. His jurisdiction is Saskatchewan and Manitoba and a little ways into Ontario. He's got about 40 churches that he is overseeing. And so that's, uh, that's not a light duty responsibility. And he's, he's, he's got that calling to be imparting those words of wisdom, those words of encouragement. Sometimes going into a church setting where he has to, you know, kind of straighten some people out and, and settle down some, some difficulties. And so it's not an easy task, but you do it well, Jordan. And we're really grateful to have you here this morning. So keep this man in prayer. Pastor Jordan Gadsby, one more time. Come on, would you show him some real gateway warmth? Amen. Well, I'm glad you're all here this afternoon, and this is the fourth and final segment of our teaching series called, Why So Sad? You know, one day there was a young boy who, he got his school photos. You, you all remember some of those days from your career as a, a student in grade school, the day that you got your, your school photos, and so like all of us, he brought them home and showed them to his mother, and then later in the day when his dad got home from work, this little boy was sitting on the front steps and his dad pulled up in the driveway. Usually this little guy would excitedly go to greet his dad when he got out of the car, but today he just sat on the doorsteps and he was actually looking kind of, of discouraged. And, and his dad went over to him and he said, hey buddy, why so sad? And, and he said, well dad, we got our school pictures back today and I, I showed them to mom and, and mom doesn't like my photo. And, and the dad couldn't believe that. He said, come on, why in the world would you think that your mother doesn't like your, your school photo? Well, she she took one look at it and she said she wants to have it blown up. <laughs> uh, Mom, I think that maybe next time a better choice of words would be, you want to have that picture enlarged, enlarged. That's right. When you're talking to members of the, the young video game generation, uh, for them, uh, blown up means something different than, than it means for you when you're organizing your family photos. All right, come on. Before we dive into this message, you know the drill. Would you stand to your feet and would you boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow His example. Say, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say amen? Come on, somebody help me celebrate the goodness of the Lord. Yeah. 
such a good thing to show up in church. You can be seated. And to those who are joining us online, welcome aboard. Nice to have you with us as well. The service will come up on YouTube at 630 this evening. If you know somebody that needs to receive this word, or even if you want to review it yourself, 630 on Sunday nights, we go online. Well, as most of you know, in this series, we've been following the adventures of of Nehemiah and his Jewish compatriots. And so they were in exile in the land of Babylon for many, many years. But then the good news is they returned to their homeland to rebuild their broken city and its walls. And so under the fearless leadership of, of Nehemiah, wow, they restored the wall of Jerusalem to its former glory. And they did it in world record time, miraculously fast, 52 Days. Come on, just turn to somebody right now and say, that's incredible. incredible. It really is an amazing engineering feat. So we come now to Nehemiah chapter 8, and the Israelites, they came together to do something that they had not done for many, many years. Now they're going to have what we would call a church service. Chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns... All the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. When it says they assembled as one man, what that's really telling us that, that they had a beautiful spirit of unity. They had this common desire. We want to hear from our God. You see, they knew that there was a book. God has a book that he has given to us. They had no idea what was in the book, but they wanted to know what was in the book. That's a good sign right there. Come on, we should have the same heart desire. We want to know what the Lord wants to say to us through the book. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, the last half of verse 1, it says, They told Ezra the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. May I just interject right here? The people appealed to Ezra. Ezra was a scribe slash priest in that day. And, and they said, please bring out the book. Now, technically, it wasn't a book, as you and I know the term book. It was more of a scroll to be unrolled and read, but that's beside the point. They, they said, bring out the book of the law of Moses, otherwise simply known as the law, or sometimes referred to as the Torah or the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses. So we're talking about the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. And they'd all been written by Moses. And, and at that time in the history of Israel, that's all the Bible there was, just the first five books. And so the people, they were so hungry. They were so curious. And they were insistent, Ezra, Please bring out the book and read it to us. This is like some of your kids at bedtime. Daddy, they're stalling, of course. Read me another bedtime story. But, but these folks, man, their hearts were so desirous. Read us the book. And folks, may I help you to understand what's happening here. For generations, the hearts of these Israelites were not toward the Lord, sadly. But now they've returned to their homeland and more importantly, their hearts are now back toward the Lord. And the temple has been rebuilt and the glorious walls of Jerusalem have been restored. And you just got to know that for, for a long time, these people, they have, they have sadly been in a state of spiritual devival. But now they have come into a season of revival, or you could call it revival. And there was just a huge crowd that was there. There that day, and, and I got to tell you, the consensus among those Bible, scho among Bible scholars is that most of those people who were there gathered in, in that courtyard by the, the water gate, most of those people had never been in anything remotely similar to what we would call a church service, and certainly they had never heard the reading of Scripture. We have a term for that. We call it biblically illiterate. This was all new to them. But 
they were ripe and ready to soak it up like so many thousands of sponges. Come on. Have you ever in your travels, have you met people who have no education whatsoever about what's in the Bible? Have you met some of those people? I'm pretty sure that we all have crossed paths with some individuals in that situation. You know, there was one guy who was a relatively new Christian, and, and he was just a green bean, and he thought that an epistle is the wife of an apostle. <laughs> now, if you know your Bible, you know that's, that's far from what an epistle is. An epistle is a letter that was written by one of the New Testament apostles. But there's lots to learn when you get on board and begin to follow Jesus and become a student of of the Word of God. See, it's one thing for somebody to say, I don't know what's in the Bible and I don't care. It's another thing altogether. When somebody says, I I admittedly, I, I don't know what's in the Bible, but I want to. When somebody's eager to learn, ooh, that's a good thing. Yeah, these people in in chapter 8, they're like, we want to know what our God has said to us in his book. They said, bring the book, read the book. And so verse 2, that's exactly what happened. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly. The law being the word of God, the book. He brought the law out and, 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 and he brought it before the assembly. The scholars who have studied all of this, and, and if you look at the statistics in the previous chapter, in chapter 7, you, you come to understand that there was in excess of 40, maybe upwards of 50,000 people that were in this gathering that day, and, and they're all eager to hear, what does God have to say to us from the scroll, from the book? And, and so, on the first day, of the seventh month, Ezra the priest, he brought this law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand, all who were old enough to be able to understand what they were hearing, especially with the help of others, as we'll read in a few moments, who were interspersed in the crowd that were helping to explain to them what these readings meant. And And so everyone that was old enough to understand. Everybody say understand. Understand. Yeah, that's a key word in this chapter. No less than six times in Nehemiah chapter 8. We we find this word understand. Ezra and his team went to great lengths to ensure that this scripture reading didn't just go over the heads of the people. And likewise for you and I. Come on, in all of our studying of scriptures, I say, Holy Spirit, open our understanding and help us to really grasp what God's word is saying to us. Come on, that'd be a good place to say, Amen. We want to know what does the Lord have to say to us from the pages of scripture, the revealed word of God. So Blessed is the man who has in his possession or the woman who has in her possession the word of the Lord. Amen. You own a Bible? Some of you have got several Bibles or, or more in your possession. Come on, let's make good use of the book. Don't ever let that thing collect dust. We read on in verse 3. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could, there it is, who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Did you catch that? From daybreak until noon, six hours, they were reading the scripture publicly. Wow, and you thought I was long-winded. Wow. It says in that verse, the people listened attentively. They were hanging on every word. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood six guys with fancy names. And then it says on his left were seven other guys with also with very Jewish names. And then it says Ezra opened the book. All the people could could see him because he was elevated. He was standing above them as he opened it. And the people all stood up. Oh, my goodness. 
Listen, it doesn't say in here that somebody, somebody got the attention of the people and said, and now please rise for the reading of the book of Genesis. No. I tell you, the way it reads here, the crowd spontaneously stood up out of respect for the book. It just says he opened the book. When he opened the book, the people all stood to their feet. Listen, that, that is body language of respect for authority that all of us understand. Come on, if you're in a courtroom and the door opens up and the judge walks in, everybody stands up. I mean, you better, because if you, if you don't, one of those security officials at the back of the courtroom, they're, they're going to be on you like, like, like a, you know, a fly on honey. They're, they're going to be tapping you on the shoulder. Sir, the judge just came in. Stand up. Right. You see, that's the, that's the body language of respect for authority. They opened the book, and the people just spontaneously stood to their feet. Then in verse 6, they were moved to worship. Yeah, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen! Amen! Imagine 50,000 people! Amen! Amen! And then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. These are holy moments. I mean, they hadn't even read any scripture yet. They just opened the book and the crowd was so responsive you understand, none of this was, was scripted. I mean, I read this and I get the feeling that they, they were just doing what came real instinctively. Man, you ever find yourself in the middle of a hot worship service and, 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 and you're thinking to yourself, well, man, I see other people raising their hands. I see them going for it. I see them being passionate about praising the Lord. I want to do that. I would really like to, to raise my hands up like that, but I feel afraid. I feel kind of self-conscious. Well, the fact is, yeah, first time you do it, it feels real awkward. But I guarantee if you keep doing it, man, it won't take long. And it feels so right. Man, I love you, Lord. I'm just reaching out to you, and I know you're reaching out to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just, you just go for it. Verse 7 says, the Levites, Yeshua and a dozen of his colleagues, they, they instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. So there were, there were these Levites that were going among the people and, and just asking if they had any questions and helping them to, to understand and get a grip on these things that were being read to them publicly. And so they instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could, there it is again, so that the people could understand what was being read. This went on for hours. But between verse 8 and verse 9, something very significant started to happen. Ezra is up on that platform. He's reading the scriptures, right? And then he hears some sniffling. He didn't think too much of it at first, but he keeps on going and he keeps reading. And, and then there's more crying and he can't help but hear people are, are crying. They're getting out their handy dandy Kleenex packages. After a while, people are weeping openly. Grown men are sobbing like, what is going on? Is it because they got to the place that, 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 that's really sentimental scripture? You know, they, they read through the creation account. Cool. And, and, and then they read about, about Noah and the flood. Wow, awesome. And then they got over into the story of Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and, and jo Joseph. Aha, that's it. The story of Joseph. That's a real tearjerker. You know, I will never forget when our son Jordan was about four or five years old. One night I was reading to him some Bible you know, storybooks before bedtime. In fact, we were reading from the picture Bible. And we were going through the story of Joseph. Now, many of you know that, that that's an incredibly touching story about how his own brothers treated him so nasty earlier on. But then years later, he was in a very, very prominent position in Egypt. And his brothers, when they saw him, they didn't even recognize him, but he recognized them. 
Boy, there was a beautiful reunion as he welcomed them and finally revealed to them his true identity. And they're thinking, oh man, he's going to get us back. But instead, he treated them so graciously. Such a beautiful moment of reconciliation and family reunion. And I'm reading through this story and then I hear the sniffling. I look down there, Jordan, he's got these, these, these tears just streaming down his cheeks. He was so touched by this story about Joseph. I'll never forget that night. Man, but I'm convinced this is not the part that they were reading when, when the people started crying when Ezra was, was reading the scripture. No, it wasn't the story of Joseph. No, no, I think they were well past the book of Genesis where we find the story of Joseph. In fact, I think they had already gone through the book of Exodus personally. I think that they were getting into the book of Leviticus when they started hearing the sound of the crowd crying. Yeah, check it out. Verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Don't be so sad. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Note, it says all the people. It's not just a few of those marshmallow types, you know, those, those old softy types, you know, interspersed in the crowd that were, that were crying. No, all the people, thousands upon multiply, thousands of people, they were all weeping as they listened to the words of the what? To the words of the law. Now, the law, that's what you call the first five books of the Bible, but the law is also the contents of the book of Leviticus. Folks, if you didn't know already, then before you leave church today, I need you to understand that the book of Leviticus is a veritable catalog of laws. Yeah, in, in the era of Moses, you could say that God laid down the law. Not only the Ten Commandments, but additionally, there were 613 other laws that were designed to govern life in Israel. And there were spiritual laws, and there were relational laws, and very practical, oh, intensely practical laws. You know, if you go through Leviticus, you will find the place where, where, where God gave sanitary laws. Yeah, he said, when you need to go to the bathroom, do not do so in the middle of the camp. Take your shovel, go well beyond the camp, dig a hole, do your business, fill it in, then come back to camp so you don't spread any disease. Wow. I mean, how practical is that? You find laws in there governing all kinds of stuff. You'll, you'll find one of the directives that God gave in there where he said, when a senior walks into the room, somebody with a whole lot more seniority than you, when grandma walks into the room, you stand up. Out of respect. There were so many laws that, that the Lord established here for. So for those who have always wondered, I, I wonder what is in the book of Leviticus. Well, well I, you know, I've heard about the book of Leviticus. What's that all about? Well, now you know. Leviticus is full of laws and commandments and rules and regulations and do's and, and don'ts and requirements and the expectations that God has of his people. Now, keep in mind, here they are reading all these, these laws, and most of these people have never, ever been introduced to Scripture. They've never heard these, these laws that were in the book, in, in, in the scroll. And so Ezra, he reads the book of the law, and then he hears the sound of people sobbing. And again, the last part of verse 9, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Obviously, this crowd came under conviction. They're hearing about all these laws of God, and they knew very well, we haven't been living like that. That's not how we do life. That we've been living pretty much the opposite of all these laws that are being read to us. We've been disobedient to God, grossly disobedient. No wonder they were tearful. So Governor Nehemiah steps up to the pulpit and, wow, he's, he's going to dismiss the service. 
He's going to pronounce the benediction. Verse 10, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food. Not just your regular food. But the best food you have with which to celebrate. Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. I think that means Dr. Pepper. And, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. So for those who have more, share with those who have less. He said, this day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You understand? Essentially, Nehemiah is saying this. Why so sad? Why cry? This is not a day to grieve, but this is a day to celebrate and be real glad. He said, I want you to go home and eat and drink. And, and, and you know, if someone is lacking some, some provisions, then those who have more, go ahead and share with them. That's, that's a great way to celebrate. And, 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 and he says, go home and celebrate with your family units. Celebrate the goodness. Of God, he says, I know, I know. You feel kind of weepy because you, you feel like you're, you, you're in violation of all these laws that we've been hearing about over the last few hours. I, I, I get that, but listen carefully. We want you to understand. As you go home from this gathering today, our God is with us. This is a time of spiritual renewal in our nation. God is showing us mercy. Our beloved city of Jerusalem has been wonderfully restored. And better yet, our hearts are turned back toward the Lord, as is evidenced by your desire to hear and know the word of God this day. He says, hear me, this is not a day to be sad, but rather this is a day to be glad and to truly rejoice and celebrate the goodness of our God. Verse 11, the Levites calmed all the people saying, be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not, there it is again, do not grieve. And then all the people, some, something is getting through. Because it says, then all the people went away to eat and drink and to send portions of food, uh, you know, to those who didn't have enough. And, and, they, and they went home to celebrate with great joy. Because now, now they understood the words that had been made known to them. Now they're like, I get it. We don't need to be crying. We need to be happy, folks. Can you see it? The emotional shift from sad to glad. Everybody went home happy, 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 as Phil Robertson would say. Now, what does all of this mean to you and I? Good question. Listen carefully. Did you know your Bible is divided neatly into two sections? You got your Old Testament you got your New Testament, right? The Old Testament. It's all about the history of, of Israel. And then the New Testament is when Jesus came on the scene to introduce the good news of the gospel, God's plan of salvation. The Old Testament is all about man relating to God on the basis of the law. The New Testament is all about man relating to God on the basis of grace. Come on, everybody say grace. Ooh, that's a rich, rich New Testament word. That's the, that's the most wonderful commodity on the face of planet Earth, the grace of God. Ooh, you just want to make sure you, you put grace on like a garment before you go out the door every morning. The grace of God, that's how he has dealt with us graciously. What I need you to understand is this. The whole purpose of the Old Testament era is to show mankind, to prove to mankind that, frankly, we are unable to obey the law. Come on, folks. Are we, are we clear on this? Human beings are not able to comply with the standard of God's Law, fallen human nature, sin nature, being what it is. We cannot fully obey God's law. Might as well admit it. That's why we need grace. That's why we need Jesus. Folks, hear me. This is a vital truth. Thou shalt understand this. Jesus came to planet Earth to deliver us from the emotional baggage of guilt and shame. He came to set us free from why so sad? 
Sin got you down. We've all been there, right? He came to get us out of the trouble that Adam and Eve got us into. Jesus came to reverse the curse. Listen, Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. This is pre-sin. That's before Adam and Eve messed up. Before sin got into the mix, you know, and tampered with what was, you know, just perfect at that point. Man, everything was ideal. It was fun camping in the Garden of Eden before sin came into the picture. So pre-sin, it says this, verse 25, Genesis 2. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Everybody say, no shame. That's how God wants us to live. No shame. He doesn't want us to live naked at this stage of the game, but he wants us to live with no shame. Now, if you compare that word of no shame in the pre-sin era, if you compare that with the following chapter, chapter 3, verse 7, which is post-sin, remember the case of the missing fruit? So now the, the original sin has been committed. Verse 7 says this. Here's the, here's the immediate fallout from Adam and Eve's misactions. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Or as someone put it, they sewed fig leaves to cover themselves, but then Eve went behind a bush and tried on some outfits made of maple leaves and sycamore leaves and willow leaves. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> That's not really in the Bible. But the point is, they felt ashamed, right? Verse 10, they went and hid themselves. And I'm telling you, ever since that day, humanity has struggled with feelings of shame and condemnation due to that crazy sin factor. You ever felt it? Pretty sure we all have. See, when we make that personal decision, you know the decision I'm talking about. It's that all-important decision to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior. When, when, we, when we lock into the gospel, when we get it, when we understand, Lord, I need a Savior. You're the only Savior there is. I admit, I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven. I need to be spiritually reborn. Lord, I need you in my life. When we make that decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ, oh my goodness, that changes everything, doesn't it? I said, that changes everything, doesn't it? Come on, how many of you know from experience, you know, enter Jesus into the picture of who you are. Wow, there's going to be some major changes. You're going to like the new you. And everybody that knows you, they're going to like the new you better than the old you. But, but that all, all important decision to say, Jesus, from here on out, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you all the way to heaven. Man, that's a, we, we need to understand, we get saved by grace. Oh yeah, we get saved by grace, not by good works. Right. Not by keeping all the laws. Right. Can't be done. Can't be done. You cannot be saved. You cannot earn heaven based on being a real, decent, respectable person. Amen. Nothing could be further from New Testament truth. Yeah, it's not by good works. It's not by keeping all the laws. Nobody can do that. Come on, just turn to your neighbor and say, nobody's perfect. Yeah, except for Jesus himself. I say, Holy Spirit, open our understanding. There's that word again. Open our understanding. Help us to get it. Salvation is by grace. That word grace. It's all over the place in your New Testament. It's, it's from the, the original New Testament, which was written in Greek. It's the Greek word charis. It means gift. Whenever you read your Bible, you come across the word grace, you can substitute the word gift in most of those places. Grace means gift. You cannot earn it by racking up X number of brownie points. In, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it just couldn't be any clearer. Here's what the apostle Paul wrote. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It's not your doing. 
It's the gift of God, not by works, not by human attainment. It's not by works so that no one can boast. Not one of us can pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, after so much work, I have finally become such an outstanding specimen of humanity that now God says he's going to let me into heaven. No, it doesn't work like that. It's all based on what Jesus has accomplished for us. Now, does God want you to be good? Of course he does, certainly. He wants us to do good, to be good. Yeah, for sure he does. But it's not on that basis that we are saved. You know, years ago, there was a company that produced cake mixes. And they tried something new. The people in their design department, man, they worked on a a mix where they finally got it down to this. All you have to do is add water. Mix it up, throw it in the oven, and you can have yourself a nice moist cake, right? Yeah. They marketed that thing. It did not fly. Couldn't figure out what's going on. Finally, it came down to this. They said, you know, people think that they have to do something. So they reworked the formula, and they came up with a recipe where you have to add one egg and then water, mix it up, and bake yourself a cake. And man, that thing just sold like hotcakes. See, because people have it naturally in their system. Well, there must be something that I have to do. And there are many, many religious people who have that notion. That's how we get on God's good side. That's how we're going to qualify for heaven, by living a really good life. By doing a lot of good stuff and helping a lot of people. Well, you know, I've, I've helped more people than I've hurt, so I'm pretty sure God's going to say, you're fit for heaven. No! Nothing could be further from the truth of the Word of God. Folks, please understand this. You have favor with God, not because you're incredible, but because you're in Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. So true. Listen carefully. Got to get a revelation of this. You got to grasp this. The law will make you so sad. But grace will make you so glad. You know, as you study the Bible, if if you travel through the Old Testament, you will find in various places in the Old Testament what I call glimpses of grace. Yeah, you'll find some, some episodes back in the Old Testament where it reminds you of New Testament style Christianity. And you're like, wow, this, this, this should be over in the New Testament. It's because there, there were some instances back in the Old Testament where, where, where you see God maybe tipping his hand and saying, yeah, this is what it's going to be like. And, and you see grace. Back in the Old Testament, and right here in Nehemiah chapter 8, this is one of those Old Testament instances where we see God dealing very graciously. This was an opportunity for Israel. They were receiving a fresh new start. They've returned to Israel. They've returned to Jerusalem. The rebuilding project is complete, and now there's a spiritual revival going on, and God has given them a fresh new beginning in their relationship with Him. He is showing them a whole lot of grace. Everybody say grace. Grace. You see, the man or woman who tries to do New Testament Christianity with an Old Testament mentality will be frustrated. Yeah, you see, trying to keep the law, that's a good works mentality. We have an expression for that. We call it performance orientation, right? Trying to please God by keeping all the rules. That's exhausting. And the apostle Paul himself, he went to great lengths in Romans chapter 7 to make the point, it can't be done. You cannot gain God's favor by your own good works. Even the great apostle Paul said, why is it, man, the things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, I do. Even Paul had to get a hold of this this truth. We are saved by grace. And then subsequent to the experience of salvation, we need to go ahead and live out the Christian life in the realm of God's grace. Not living under the law, but living in the grace of God. Lest we be frustrated by the same old, same old, same old sins. Why so sad? Well, because I did it again. Understand this. 
When you read your Bible through the lens of the law, you feel guilty, you feel shame, you feel condemnation. Oh man, I did it again. You feel sadness when you're trying to do life. Seeing all these situations through the lens of the law is a bad move. But when you read your Bible through the lens of grace, when you live your life through, through the, 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 the perspective of, of grace, man, that's when you start feeling a whole lot of forgiveness and favor. That's when you feel gladness. That's when you feel Romans 8, 1, where, where it says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Come on, church. Everybody shout, no condemnation. Amen. Speaking of rebuilding the temple and the walls of Jerusalem, listen to what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. It says, for in Scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, in Jerusalem, a chosen and precious cornerstone. This is alluding to Jesus. He's the chosen and precious cornerstone of the temple. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Amen. It says the very same thing in Romans chapter 10, verse 11. Whoever trusts in the Lord will never be put to shame. Man, if you're here this afternoon, if you have any nagging sense of, of shame about something in your past or even something in your present, please understand this. You do not need to carry that baggage with you any longer. You can lay it down at the foot of the cross on this communion Sunday. Someone says, but Pastor Brian... Isn't it a good thing to feel a twinge of, of guilt if I've done something wrong? Yes, absolutely, of course. That's why it's so important for us to learn how to discern between conviction and condemnation. See, conviction, wow, that, 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 that's, that's a good thing. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. That's when you, you, know, you feel uncomfortable with the fact that you know you've got an attitude that you've been entertaining towards so-and-so, and you just know it's not right, and the Holy Spirit is like, you need to go and apologize to that person. The Holy Spirit gently getting on your case. That's conviction. That's a good thing. We do well to be sensitive to that and, and to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But condemnation, wow, that's a different thing altogether. That's the devil's work. Oh, yeah, he's the accuser of the brethren. He'll try to push your nose in the mud of your wrong activities. Yeah, condemnation, that's, for, that's from the devil. Conviction, that's, that's from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes there's a fine line between conviction and condemnation, but, but help us, Lord, teach us, tutor us on how to figure out which it is. Say, devil, get behind us. And Holy Spirit, I realize you're convicting me, and so I, I'm, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to correct my ways. You see, whenever you feel guilty in your conscience, that's why we have this recourse that we call 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. That's, that's the verse. Some of you know it very well because you've utilized it so often, right? If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow! That's an awesome promise of God. And if that won't produce gladness in you, then, honey, I don't know what will. Absolute forgiveness based on God's faithful grace. You see, when you view life through the lens of the law, you live with what we call sin consciousness. Oh, I blew it again. But when you view your life through the lens of grace, man, that's when you live with righteousness consciousness. Because see, the Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear in the book of Romans that when you're in Christ, in other words, when you've received Jesus as your Savior, then the righteousness of Jesus has been officially credited to your account. The term that the Apostle Paul used when he originally wrote it, it's actually an accounting term. He said, yeah, the righteousness of Jesus. The moment that you say, yes, please, Jesus, I need, I need you to be my Savior. Please come into my life. From that very moment, the righteousness of Christ himself is credited to your account. And God sees you in that light. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, my goodness. <laughs> you, you're you're going you're gonna, to uh, experience that, that righteousness of Jesus. And you get your mind renewed to that. 
begins to affect the way you live. You live with a righteousness consciousness. Wow, that's way different from living with a sin consciousness. Oh, I'm such a lousy Christian, I blew it again. (laughs) Understand this. The more you think of yourself and speak of yourself in terms of grace, and in terms of the righteousness of Christ in you, then the more you will behave like it. The more you will live up to it. And the more you will experience supernatural gladness. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let me repeat that. It's such an important statement. Listen, the more you think about yourself and speak about yourself in terms of grace and the righteousness of Christ in you, then the more you are going to live up to that and the more you will experience gladness, the gladness that comes from doing life on the basis of grace instead of being under the dark cloud of, of condemnation that comes by focusing on the law. Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do all the do's and don't all the don'ts. Lord, teach us how to live by grace. All right, I want to conclude with one of my all-time favorite Peanuts comic strips. You all know Charlie Brown and the, and the crew. Of course, these comic strips were written by Charles Schultz, who was a man who loved the Lord. And in this particular comic strip, it's Lucy and Linus. And Lucy is in the house. She's looking out the window. It's raining hard. And boy, she's not looking too happy. She's looking kind of glum, kind of sour. And along comes Linus. And he basically says to her, Lucy, why so sad? What's wrong? And, and she says, well, I'm concerned that if it, if it keeps up raining like this, that the world is going to be flooded again. And Linus says, not so. God has already sent the rainbow. He's already given us the promise that never again will he destroy the, the world with a flood. And then in the following frame, now Lucy is sporting a smile. And Lucy says, oh, thank you. That makes me feel so much better. And in the final frame, Lana says, yeah, good theology will do that for you. So true. How many of you have discovered, man, good theology, biblical theology will help you to move from sad to glad. Come on, say amen if you know that to be true. Come on, would you stand to your feet? Oh, thank you, Lord. It's it's communion Sunday. Wow, what great timing. That's the time we can celebrate communion. And we can do so with this absolute determination in our spirit. I am not walking out that door today still bearing any sense of shame. No matter what it was that somebody else did to you, no matter what it was that you did to somebody else, we can deal with it very quickly. We receive these emblems today and we understand, wow, there's a power of God that accompanies these these little tiny emblems that remind us of what Jesus accomplished for us through his death and resurrection. He came to set us free from shame. He doesn't want us bearing the the baggage of shame as we carve our path through life. He wants us to be able to shake it off and say, Lord, I I clearly understand what you accomplished for me. And you're the Savior that releases people from all that guilt, all that condemnation. Let's get rid of that today. Yes. Now listen, communion is for believers. So first things first, Let's pray the prayer of salvation. Because everybody who knows Jesus as their Savior, wow, they're entitled to come to this table of the Lord. That's just another name for communion. And and, and we can receive these emblems and be reminded of the, the covenant of love that we have with our Savior. Yeah, we do this on a regular basis, right? First Sunday of every month. We celebrate communion to be remembering again his death and resurrection that helps me to live free from all of the judgment that the law says I deserve. Amen. So listen, let's pray together. Let's pray the prayer of salvation. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody in the house to join me in praying this prayer. But with every head bowed and every eye closed in this personal moment of commitment, before we all pray, there may very well be a number of individuals here today, and 
You're not really sure where you stand with the Lord. You don't know that you're born again, but you sure want to be. Man, if you want in on this promise of being a part of the family of God, this is your moment, and I so recommend. Make that decision, my friend. Simple show of hands before we all pray the prayer together. If you know that you need to acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, just raise your hand wherever you are. Yes, I see your hands over on my left. Thank you. I see all of you. Good for you. You can put your hands down. Are there others? Who else? Just wave at me if you know. I need to commit or recommit. Yes, I see your hand in the center. Good for you. Who else? This is your day. Say, Jesus, from here on out, man, I'm running with you, Lord. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you in good faith that my life will look so different in the future than it did in the past. Anybody else? Just just wave at me wherever you are. If you know, Pastor, I need to do this. I got to commit or recommit. For those who are watching online, this is for you as well. Come on, church. All of you that raise your hand and everybody else, let's all pray and affirm our loyalty to Jesus Christ. Come on, let's pray this. Heavenly Father, of course I give my life to you. Jesus, you're the Savior of my soul. I believe you died on that cross to break the power of shame off of my life. I believe you rose from the dead to give me a brand new start in life. Forgive me, Lord, for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live the Christian life. Seeing everything through the lens of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, you've got a little communion kit. If you didn't get one of these communion kits on your way in, now's the time to just wave, wave your hand. We want to make sure everybody gets in on this deal. We've got some more at the back. If you didn't get one, all right. Everybody's got a kit. You peel back that first layer of cellophane, access that little wafer, which symbolically reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ that was nailed to the cross. The Bible calls him a sacrificial lamb. Man, he didn't lay his life down for nothing. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, by his stripes, those awful whippings that Jesus took on his back, by his stripes, we are made whole. Come on, everybody say, by his stripes, I am made whole, spirit, soul, and body. I am healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, with a deep sense of gratitude, let's receive that wafer. Hallelujah. Don't be surprised if there's any aches and pains in your body that just go. They just go in Jesus' name. We receive our healing. Thank you, Lord. Right where we stand, we receive your supernatural power to heal us. Make us completely whole. And then, of course, there is that little cup of grape juice. You peel back that next layer of plastic carefully. And there it is, the grape juice that reminds us of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. By his blood, we are forgiven. We are redeemed. Amen. We are heaven bound, but I'll tell you, we are shame free. We are condemnation free. All of our guilt, all of our guilt, it was all placed on Jesus. He took our place. He took the judgment of God that our sins warranted so that we could be off the hook. Everybody say, I receive that. Say, I am forgiven. I am redeemed. I am free from all shame. In the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Come on, let's receive that cup with grateful heart. Mm. Hallelujah, how sweet is that? Oh, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. Folks, you know, this pretty much brings our service to a conclusion, but I want you to know that after we've dismissed our service with a word of blessing in just a moment, this altar's still open. And our prayer partners will be only too happy to pray with you. If, you. if you need some personal individual prayer, you come on up front here and 
one of our prayer partners will be happy to pray with you. If you raised your hand to receive Jesus a few moments ago, make your way to the, the table. Before you leave, get to that table in the southwest corner of the auditorium. There'll be somebody there that's just they got some, some great literature that we'd like to put in your hands that'll really help you along in your walk with the Lord. But other than that, I, I simply want to say this. Hey, next Sunday, next Sunday, Pastor Barb is going to be delivering the goods. She's going to be preaching the word. You want to be here next Sunday. It's Mother's Day. Bring mom along. If you're the mom, bring your kids along and let's have a terrific celebration on Mother's Day in the house of God. But my friends, the blessing of the Lord be upon you now. As you go from church, come on, let's do like they did in Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's go. Let's eat and let's drink and let's celebrate and let's rejoice our hearts in the Lord and in one another. The Holy Spirit, go before you and prepare the way. Have a wonderful week. Have a supernatural week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Gateway. We'll be officially dismissed. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that you were so encouraged by the worship and the message. And hey, if you've been blessed by the worship and the messages here at Gateway, we'd love if you partner with us. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give to do so. And if you're in the Regina area, we would love to have you join us in person for one of our services very soon. There's a chair here waiting for you. But if you're not able to make it in person in Regina, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for another Church Online.